linking minds across oceans, telekinetically enhancing your body's healing process. Cable, is your body even capable of handling such power? Today on the Comic Book Report, the Deadpool and Cable Omnibus from Marvel Comics. Stick around and check it out. Hey, how's it going everyone? This is Dominic and today you're tuning in to the Comic Book Report where we review comic books and graphic novels so you can get an idea of what to read. And today I got a really fun series in the form of the Deadpool and Cable Omnibus. It's been a long time since I've read this entire run, so revisiting some of these issues was an absolute blast. But before we dive into today's review, I just want to shout out our channel sponsor, OrganicPriceBooks.com. If you're looking to pick up your own comic book collected editions, definitely check them out with the link in my bio. You can also use my code, the comic book report, at checkout to receive $2 off of your order. Please note if you use my affiliate link or code to make a purchase, I will earn a small commission, but it's a fantastic way to support the channel. Thank you so much for considering. Now let's get started with today's omnibus review. First, some quick facts about today's collection. The issues in this volume were written primarily by Fabian Nietzietza and illustrated primarily by Patch Zercher, Riley Brown, and Ron Lim. The comics in this volume were first published by Marvel Comics beginning in 2004. The volume itself collects Cable and Deadpool, issues 1 through 50, Deadpool, GLI, Summer Fun Spectacular, and material from Deadpool, issue 27. And finally, this oversized hardcover edition has nice glossy paper stock, a sewn binding, and a total of 1,272 pages. At this time, I'd like to issue a brief spoiler warning. I will be flipping through the contents of today's collection and commenting on plot points throughout. You've been advised. Okay, and here's our first look at that Deadpool and Cable Omnibus. I will say I do have the direct market cover for this recent reprint on the book. I'll go ahead and throw up a picture of the standard edition cover so you can compare and choose which cover you prefer for yourself. There was a second direct market cover, but that was only available on previous printings. While we continue our examination of the dust jacket, I also want to mention as well, if you noticed, I said this collects the series Cable and Deadpool, but you might notice the title of this omnibus is Deadpool and Cable. I think the reason for that is that Deadpool has a bit more cultural popularity, so for the omnibus edition, they went ahead and threw his name up first, but the actual issues and the name of this series when it was coming out in those individual issues was in fact Cable and Deadpool. At any rate, this is a really big book and it's a ton of fun. For me, this is a great example of a one and done kind of omnibus or comic book collection where we have just a full beginning, middle, and end to the story arc here. And I feel like overall, it's a great place to begin for new readers. As you can see now, we're looking at the dust jacket one more time, examining the interior flaps and all the sides, and then I'm going to go ahead and transition to showing you the under the dust jacket artwork for this omnibus. I really love the print they have here. It's really interesting. We basically have uh, the characters of Deadpool and Cable, and it's a nice kind of wraparound image where they took the characters and we have just kind of a nice background. Uh, really interesting that they chose this for the under the dust jacket artwork, but I think it really showcases our two characters rather nicely. And whether it's the under the dust jacket print or the dust jacket itself, I think the art we have here is a really good indication of what you can find in the book during the actual run itself. And I personally enjoy that as a collector, where the cover gives you a fair idea of what you can expect on the inside. And as we finish our look at the exteriors, I do want to take a moment just to showcase the binding for this omnibus. At over 50 issues, like I mentioned, this is a really big book. It's well over 1,200 pages, and so I do want to examine the binding. Happy to say it's a nice sewn binding with quite an eye, and so I think this actually lays out pretty well, all things considered. I had no issues with my binding personally, and you can definitely take a look while I flip through the book to see what the gutters look like, things like that. 
And now we can dive into the book proper. The end pages, first few pages, are nothing totally new. We have a title page, some bibliography, publication information, and then we kind of have the creator mapping table of contents kind of page. Unfortunately, with a modern omnibus like this, we don't have a proper table of contents with pages to kind of index and map each issue, which is a bit of a shame, but nothing too unexpected, things like that. As far as what's included in this book, I already mentioned it earlier, but the bulk of this omnibus is the 50 issues of that cable and deadpool run uh so that's really what we're looking at here plus a few extras kind of thrown in there uh but overall a really good collection like i mentioned earlier i do think it's a good on-ramp for newer people checking out these characters uh, i think one thing i will say about it is i think that cable specifically is not depicted like i've seen him really anywhere else in comic books this was my first exposure to cable and then when i went back and read some of his earlier appearances I felt like the character was almost unrecognizable. Granted, he might have developed or matured as the kind of Marvel continuity continued on. But again, the cable we have here is quite a bit different than the cable we see in some of his earlier appearances. I would say Deadpool is pretty consistent in a lot of his appearances, including those here. He's zany, breaking the fourth wall, kind of manic, and super action-packed. That being said, this is actually one of my favorite interpretations of the Deadpool character. I think that he's treated with a lot of heart and care, and I think that we get to see actually quite a bit of depth from the character of Deadpool throughout this run. And I think that that's really what helps make this series so engaging. For those that, again, don't know really much about this series, this is at its core kind of a buddy team action book. I guess I'll say it like that. And because of that, it has a lot of the kind of buddy comedy feel. We have these two mismatched partners in the characters of Cable and Deadpool, respectively, who don't really want to have much to do with each other. In fact, they really kind of grate on each other's nerves. But through kind of a weird sequence, sequence of events in the first major story arc in this book, the two of them find themselves more or less inextricably linked. And let me explain kind of what happened. This book kind of opens up where there's this sort of interesting cult or church kind of group that's basically trying to turn the entire world blue in an effort to kind of bring about world peace somehow. Deadpool kind of gets lured in there with the promises that they can heal his skin condition and make everyone look uniform so he doesn't feel as much of an outcast, and so he kind of takes up a mercenary job to help them out. We, meanwhile, we have Cable, who's at a really interesting crossroads in his life, where the kind of telepathic, telekinetic abilities as a mutant he had that is usually dedicated to him keeping his techno-organic virus in check, see the metal sides of his body, well, at any rate, his powers seem to be growing exponentially, and so now he no longer needs to use his telepathic and telekinetic powers just to keep the virus in check. He can do that almost as an afterthought, and now he has these growing and growing and growing psychic powers and he almost is trying to figure out what he should do with them or what kind of responsibility he has to use these powers now that they have enough power to really shape the world in many ways we see cable kind of at a philosophical just sort of crisis we have him kind of trying to touch into a more spiritual side of his personality at any rate he comes into the crosshairs of this sort of church and they kind of become at odds at any rate a lot of action and just zaniness ensues and ultimately both Deadpool and Cable are exposed to this virus that basically starts to liquefy them. Cable has the ability to heal Deadpool, but Deadpool needs to help Cable by giving him some of his blood that has his mutant healing factor abilities or, you know, artificial healing factor abilities. At any rate, as the two characters begin to liquefy, their kind of fluids sort of interact, the blood transfers across, and Cable is able to basically reconstitute them free of this virus that this cult sort of inflicted on them. At any rate, it's kind of a weird sequence of events, but after that, the body slide teleportation technology that Cable has access to, anytime he wants to teleport around the world, it basically drags Deadpool along with him and vice versa. And so that's the thing that links them after this initial story arc. They do team up and stop this cult from kind of becoming a thing, but Cable basically tries to take power and tries to unify the world. 
it's a really interesting story arc, and I think it's a really odd place to begin a series like this, but it really does help establish the groundwork that's needed to really have the dynamic for these two characters, because at the beginning, we have them definitely at odds, and we will see that throughout this entire run as they really grow uh, and just try to figure out their friendship, their allyship, the way they can just kind of partner on these missions, even though there's a lot of tension and conflict just kind of in their relationship to begin with. Right from the jump, this early story arc, I really liked that there was a plot convention that made sense within the context of the issue that kept these two characters bound together. Because especially after that first story arc, they really try not to have much to do with one another, but they find themselves pulled back into each other's lives. I think it's also just interesting to note that the kind of power level situation for Cable is a recurring plot line we have throughout the at least first half of this omnibus, and we have Deadpool kind of first at odds with that, and then ultimately just finding, again, that camaraderie with the character of Cable. Uh, throughout this omnibus, we have a lot of fun sort of appearances from different members of the Marvel Universe, particularly the X-Men team. That was a lot of fun for me, seeing them pop up, seeing Deadpool wanting to be part of the X-Men, seeing Cable just at odds with them. Uh, really interesting, like I said, just set of stories there. Overall, I think the general feel for this book, beyond kind of that buddy action comedy, is really this idea of kind of mission-based storylines. We have them, both Deadpool and Cable, or just one or the other, dispatched on a lot of these sort of international missions, and because of that, each story arc, again, is kind of relegated to each kind of mission. And I think that that was a really elegant way to set up a series like this, especially with Deadpool being kind of a mercenary character, and Cable not being too far behind that. I think it was, again, a really good setup. There is plenty of time for them to focus just on Cable or just on Deadpool throughout this book. It might lean a little bit more Deadpool as far as some of the solo adventures we get in this book, but overall there is a sense of balance here, and I think the kind of odd couple dynamic really works for these two characters. Like I said, this book has a surprising amount of heart, especially with how it depicts Deadpool, but I think you can really see the heart in the friendship that begins to bloom between these two title characters. Something else I want to note as we pass this one here, one thing I do like about this comic as well is we have kind of a recap page that begins most of the issues in this book. It usually has Deadpool or sometimes some of the other characters basically breaking the fourth wall to tell you as the reader what's been going on in this book to set the stage. I think this would have been absolutely helpful reading this month to month as it kind of helps refresh you but in an omnibus it is still fun because it makes this volume really easy to dive back into at any given time if you're not binge reading this and frankly, even if you are reading this cover to cover very quickly, these recap pages are still a lot of fun. We get a lot of good humor in these recap pages, and I think it was just a really nice touch for this run in general. And it was really a joy to experience them again as I was reading through these issues, especially in the beginning of the book. As far as plotline goes, I'm going to keep it kind of high-level overview. I'm not going to go into a ton of specifics. I told you kind of the setup in the early volume. Uh, there's another story arc I like where Deadpool's kind of hot across dimensions and we actually have the tie-in to the house of m kind of storyline that happened i know i might have mentioned this storyline when i did the house of m omnibus review at any rate we do have that tie-in here in the actual cable and deadpool run and it's a fun issue it has to do with mr sinister and a baby version of cable in this other universe during house of m and it's just kind of a funny hijinks kind of issue just the image of deadpool trying to care for baby cable just a lot of fun we do also have that baby coming with Deadpool as we go into the subsequent issues, and we actually see that baby rapidly age until Cable's basically a grown man and kind of caught up with Deadpool again. Switching over to the art for a moment, I do want to highlight the art here. I really think it's pretty strong. I think the character models are really, really consistent. Even as the actual art in the series changes hands a little bit throughout the run, I think the style is close enough that you never feel like you have any real jarring art transitions at any point. There's a lot of great two-page spreads and action sequences, splash pages. It's definitely a modern book, so we get a lot of panel experimentation, and I think it really works for a series like this. There's a really good sense of 
momentum, pacing, movement, which is so good, again, for that kind of action kind of feel of this book. And the art should absolutely be commended. I think that it is some of the sharpest I've ever seen these characters look. And again, the action is just flawless. It does have a very cinematic kind of feel to it, especially as they go on some of their missions. It is very different from someone like Brian Hitch, who did stuff like The Ultimates and that Fantastic Four Millar Hitch omnibus that I reviewed not too long ago. But in the same way, there is this cinematic quality I definitely see in the art in this book as well. It feels like I'm watching a really good movie or kind of television series, and I mean that as an absolute compliment. The art is so immersive, and it really, really does serve the storytelling quite well. I want to say as well, this is probably the longest series I've ever personally read from Fabian Netsietza, and it's one of my favorites. I really like how he handled the two characters. Even though this is a version of Cable I haven't really seen played with before, I think it definitely works, and I think finding this character at a really interesting crossroads in his life, what's going on with his powers, what he wants to do about that, really made it ripe for a lot of good storytelling and character-driven motivations, and I think he handled that really well. And again, this is one of my favorite incarnations of Deadpool. I also am a big fan of the Daniel Way run on the character. I think what both of those runs, both that one and this one here from Nitsietsa, do is it really humanizes Deadpool. In the midst of all the kind of bombastic, manic energy that Deadpool always brings, you do get to see that heart there. You do get to see that this is still actually a person, a real person. And I think that that makes it so engaging. And I think for me, Deadpool works best when you have a lot of action and a lot of humor, but he doesn't border too far into just openly, blatantly obnoxious at all times, because I do think this character can definitely straddle that line, and he can really become a caricature of himself very, very rapidly, and I'm happy to say for the most part, that really doesn't happen throughout this whole run. This is a Deadpool that's about as grounded as he's ever going to be, and I think pairing him with a really strong character like Cable was just really a masterstroke. What a fun way to blend these two very different characters in a way that feels like it just works. Another thing I really enjoy about this book is that while it does have tie-ins like House of M and there's actually a Civil War tie-in, things like that, I really feel like they leave this book alone to just do what this book's going to do. What I mean by that is sometimes with modern comic book runs especially, when you have big crossover events or big things that can kind of disrupt a lot of different titles, it's not uncommon to feel like there's issues that are just kind of random or you know your main title gets pulled into all of these other weird adventures and it kind of breaks your feeling of cohesion within a run. I feel like even with the House of M tie-in and the Civil War tie-in, I think it blends very seamlessly with the rest of what Nitsietsu was doing with Cable and Deadpool. And because of that, we really have a singular and really self-contained reading experience with this omnibus, which is one of the reasons I really recommend it on the list of one-and-done comic book runs. It's really, really a great way to just enjoy a full, lengthy title on a book without feeling like you need to buy a bunch of other different titles crossovers to feel like what's happening with what, things like that. I mean, even look at the modern X-Men era, this Krakoa era, basically everything after House of X, Powers of Ten. While I am a big fan of all of it, I do feel like you almost have to keep up with all the titles to get the full picture of what's happening, rather than just being able to pick up like X-Men and feel like you have the whole picture of what's happening. And I kind of miss the days where you can pick up a title and it was really self-contained, and maybe it will cater to an event or two, but it doesn't disrupt the main story, and you can get the full picture just reading one title alone. And I do really like that with this book, and it's something I really want to commend. Going back to the plot line for a bit, and this is a bit spoiler heavy, so just be prepared. I did do a spoiler warning at the beginning, but basically around the 40s issues in this book, there's a really big plot event that happens that involves Cable making a particular kind of sacrifice. It's a really moving scene, and for my money, it's really the high point of this entire omnibus. It's certainly the climax of the conflict. We have Cable just really showing how much he cares for Deadpool in the way that he's been just a great friend and ally throughout all of the adventures we have in this book, and we have Cable basically making a sacrifice play. After that point in the book, this title really focuses on Deadpool and his supporting cast of characters. And I do think that this is an interesting shift in a 
book called Cable and Deadpool, or in this case, the Deadpool and Cable Omnibus, but I think it still works. This is, however, maybe my lower point of the actual Cable and Deadpool run because it really becomes a Deadpool book, and we miss out on some of the momentum we've had with these two characters for the first 40-something issues of the book. I do feel like everything after that issue with Cable feels like it's kind of the falling action as far as the plot goes, the sense of conflict, everything feels like it begins to wind down. Those issues are all still really great. I mean, we have some great appearances from the X-Men and Wolverine and some of the other members of Deadpool's little group, uh, but these issues feel like they're of less consequence. There's not really a big overarching story like we had leading up into the 40s. Um, so that's something to note about this book. It's the last handful of issues. They're still a lot of fun, but they feel like closer to uh, epilogue material, wrap-ups, one-off little adventures, rather than big, massive story arcs. Uh, one high point about those issues, though, is that we do have Deadpool just kind of processing what happened with his friend, and we get to see, like I said, even more heart from Deadpool. We get to see some more nuanced kind of emotions, maybe some maturity, maybe not. That might be too far for Deadpool, but it's, again, probably as close as I've ever seen, and it really feels earned by this point in the run, and I think it was all handled really well. I think that this book certainly has a lot of great twists and turns, and there's enough in the plot lines here to keep me invested. I think with the kind of mission-based story arc approach, there are a lot of interesting kind of geopolitics and just kind of espionage, intrigue, action features to this book that it really does stand out on the shelves from some of the other kind of New York-based superhero fare. This does feel like a global book that has them sort of going everywhere. And I really did like that with this book. Like I said, this book feels pretty set apart, and it's not just because of the interesting pairing of the title characters. I feel like Nitsietsa really takes chances, and this book doesn't feel like a straight-laced sort of X-Men book. It doesn't feel like a straight-laced street-level superhero book. It's, it's just this weird amalgam of different genres that it just plays to the strengths of these characters in ways I would not have expected prior to reading the run. The only other downside for this omnibus, and you'll see it as we reach the end here, is that there's really not a good amount of extras. There's really only a few pages. There are variant covers, but they're really laced throughout the individual issues rather than keeping them all at the back of the book. So the extras at the back are very lean. I guess it's not too surprising given how big this omnibus is at over 50 issues, but I would have liked to see a little more. At any rate, that brings us to really the end of this collection, a really great omnibus edition here. And now it's time to give it a grade. For easily my best example of a buddy action comedy in comic books ever, the Comic Book Report is happy to give the Deadpool and Cable Omnibus from Marvel Comics an A-. This book is a ton of fun to read, and it really is full of surprises. Perhaps no greater surprise than the amount of emotional depth the author gives to these two primary characters, or really how character-driven a lot of the narrative is in this book. Seamlessly blending, again, this kind of international espionage thriller kind of action with this really zany, fun comedy. It really is just a masterstroke in writing. Some of my favorite from Nitsietsa I've ever had the pleasure of reading. A really good showcasing for both of these characters, albeit perhaps in a different lens than you've ever seen them. A fantastic example of a great one-and-done comic book run, and a good place for new comic book readers. I can recommend this series, but let me know what you think of Cable and Deadpool in the comments below. And until next time, this has been the Comic Book Report. Thank you so much for watching. Please don't forget to leave a like and a comment. And until next time, have a good one.